has a beginning but no end so let's welcome mr rana rajan director hr credit suisse sir it's an honor to have you with us may i now request May I now request Dr. Dimple Saini, Director, Corporate Relations, to felicitate our guest with a bouquet of flowers. I call upon student manager Paridi Pandey to introduce our guest. The biggest problem in our society is mediocrity. Mediocrity of mind, mediocrity of knowledge and mediocrity of wisdom. It is so rare to have people with passion in their blood dedication in their soul and inspiration in their presence good morning one and all today i have the privilege to introduce one such guest mr rana rajan to you all mr rajan is an alumnus of symbiosis institute of management studies and is the director at credit suez india he is with the company for almost 10 significant years sir looks over compliance coverage for segments like equities listed derivatives fixed income investment banking etc he also licensed with regulators such as the reserve bank of india and the securities and exchange board of india prior to this he was head of legal and compliance at dsp merrill lynch investment managers so we are grateful for your presence here we are fortunate enough to have you and we are assured of a session rich in knowledge and wisdom from a corporate stalwart like you I now request sir to address the students. Thank you. No, I don't have any 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 presentation board so and I don't need anything. Okay. So good morning friends. no sir i'm i'm like you okay i i have not come here as a, a senior or i've come here as a friend so i'll be as open as uh one can be in fact very simple i just want to ask her we are uh, uh, we were in the college almost at the same time i wanted to tell while in college she didn't give a rose at that time and now after so many years she is give, <laughs> giving me a bouquet of flowers <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so to 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 late in the day <laughs> i i uh, dimple i was telling them that we have so much to connect during the college days you didn't offer me a, a rose and now you are giving me the rose <laughs> so i i i have come here i fully with a with a blank paper in fact a blank paper that that's what it by what i i i get i'll i'll note down and try to uh speak about uh what you want to hear from me uh like a friend is what i i thought i'd do uh first is i i thought i need to to firstly connect with you and and rather not try to talk to you about anything technical 
because out here you are looking towards to me to see what is there outside the campus. So let me tell you what the first thoughts which came to my mind when uh, the call from here came to me. Uh, I, Kadam sir called me sir, saying that you have to address the initial badge and then subsequently Bala sir called me to say that you'll have to address the current badge. Uh, so I went through the BIMS uh, uh, website just to see where the college stands because I have not been in touch with neither Kadam sir or Bala sir for a very long time. So the moment I opened the, the website, I could start relating. There, there I see the Balasa's photo with uh, the former president, Gani Sail Singh, and one of my classmates, Avta Singh Sohail, out there. And then I go down there, I see the, the usual statement of Balasa, which is continuing for more than two decades. Problems are opportunities. <laughs> it still says, says there, and he's continuing to live on that. So what's the problem here? So to me, the problem is Bala sir or the director here as a problem to bring some fresh light from outside the campus to you because you are seeing what is there in the campus. Now look at me, what is the opportunity for me? I have an opportunity to meet with some young crowd, make some friends, probably walk away with a good looking girlfriend, <laughs> right? <laughs> So that's an opportunity for me. So that's the, that's the journey of uh, uh, Bala sir and the way he has uh, carried things forward. So for you, you have the benefit of uh, him and, uh, oh, in fact, I, I was looking right here. I was, I, I, for a moment, I'm just realizing the magnitude of uh, the crowd that is sitting beside me. I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, meet your expectations. I don't know how much I can. I'm not one of the greatest orators. Uh, rather, I, even if I have pr tried to uh, write a speech for myself, I don't know how successful I would have been. I don't know. So I, I'm testing my oratory skills right here. I, I, I have tried it several times, but it's not that it's the first time that I'm, I'm addressing such an audience. I, I have probably come and stood here maybe in the same auditorium five years back and have addressed the students, but I don't do it very often and I'm, I'm not too good at preparing a speech. Anyhow, uh, coming to share some of those uh, uh, experiences with Balasa, which is something which you can connect with. Uh, I don't think you, you get to uh, interact with Balasa uh, so often these days like the time which we had so we always used to have a love, hate, respect relationship because of various reasons. But you have a lot to learn from uh, the path that he has uh, traversed through his career. You could find pitfalls, but you could also find things to admire. But admiration has no meaning if you don't get inspired and do something for yourself. That's the key. Now, what is there to admire from him? And what is the pitfall? Which I, I told Bala sir that I would be opening up some of my observations which might be right wrong. Uh, I have seen Bala sir probably 20 years back, by which time he had already crossed his 50. And uh, then he worked in symbiosis, built up symbiosis, then he came out of there with some controversies, then he had to start again from scratch here. He built all. So what's the one could look at as a pitfall? During his prime age, he worked in the army as a low-ranking low officer, not exploiting his capacity. He's a gifted person, but he didn't exploit it at the right time. But that may not be true. Probably at the right time, if you would have tried, he may not have been access as successful as he would have made through now. So what I want to remind you is, and I'll, I'll come back to Balasa, sir. Each one of you is gifted. You need to wake up. That wake up call comes, I don't know at what time and when you realize that you are gifted. Now my observation of Balasa, so probably after working in the uh, army, as not even a, a commissioned officer, he retires. 
and he doesn't know what to do. Then he takes up some MPM program or some post-graduation programs in symbiosis and starts uh, acquiring one after the other uh, degree and then start building up an organization and he's too successful. So till such time he, w he was in the army, he was happy with, with a, a small income and then he carried forward. So that wake up call came when he was pushed out of the army or rather when retirement came and he didn't know what to do. So he was always gifted, but he did not have a compulsion to perform. So that's the, the, the case here for you. So you are all gifted. So you need to know that you are gifted and when to wake up. Now I'll, I'll tell you the, uh, a, a, a classic uh, example of how Bala sir had his first breakthrough, in, in my opinion. The, the photograph which he flashes about that uh, photo of the president, Yanni Selsing. So we were the first batch of the college and Bala sir tried to inspire us by making us uh, do company internship and so on and so forth. And then he suddenly, suddenly comes up with an idea that I'm going to do a industry seminar so that we get a good connect. That has become a, a more of a theme now. You have, that, that's what we are doing now. At that time, we did not have any such infrastructure or even connect with the corporate world. So what he inspired us is that he said, I will get the president of India to inaugurate the seminar. And uh, one of our batch mates who had thick mustache, he even said that if he does that, I will shave half my mustache. He even <laughs> did that. And actually, from there, we all got motivated and we went around the campuses uh, of uh, various corporates, literally begging for some sponsorship money. And that time we didn't have some uh, telephone facilities, or mobile facilities, so we literally had to travel for hours to get to these places and drive for the, across for getting the money. Now, what is it that Bala Sir's uh, strength or what did he see there, which we did not see. We had a batchmate who, so Balasa knew the opening to the president's office. We had it there, Sunita Yadav, her brother was the ADC of president and Balasa still remembers the term ADC because the personal uh, uh, Paridi was just, attached to me, she sent the first SMS to me, she said, I am your ADC. So Balasa still uses those terms, ADC. So that was the, the first breakthrough. So actually the opportunity was in us. He identified it. In our batch, there is one person who can connect to the president of India and he could actually exploit it, and which he exploited it. The companies who would have given a sponsorship perhaps in my opinion, has given the money out of sheer sympathy and not by seeing anything. Because by giving some sponsorship to a college like ours uh, and for a seminar in Delhi, if you look at the photograph that is in, in your magazine, or you'll see a banner of Colgate Palmer Leaf and you would have several other uh, banners there. None of the companies would have benefited, and if you think logically, what sense does it make for somebody to give you a sponsorship for a less known college setting up a seminar in, in Delhi by putting a banner, what are they gaining? But out of sheer sympathy that two students are making multiple approaches to the marketing manager or the sales manager asking some sponsorship, they had given it. But all this put together, we made it happen. So that, that's something which Balasa made it happen. So that's the opportunity which he found and he actually executed it. So what you have to learn from it is you have to get inspired by what he's performing for you. He built up such a huge campus uh, from scratch. Again, I can, I can tell you I had connected with him during that initial time. You would not even think of making that attempt to do that, he did not have any money to set up this campus. What would have helped him to put up something like this? 
he actually dipped into his previous experience of setting up of a college and relying on correspondence courses and he knew that that is where the money is and he I think uh, approached all the army cantonments and then popularized his correspondence course and his breakthrough came through I believe he managed to convince the Times of India a few other uh, newspapers to carry full page advertisement of his in, it was, I don't think it was Balaji Institute of Modern Management, I think the name was a little different earlier, whatever it is, and he managed to publicize few uh, of the advertisement and he got a brand. That brand, he took it to the banks and he got financing and that is how your institute is, how, how old is the institute, I think 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, 18. So in 18 years, I, I, I think this campus was up probably seven, eight years back itself. So he built this from scratch. So it is his willpower to start from scratch and build this is what shows that what one can do. So that is actually there in, in, in each one of you. So you have to look for that opportunities and exploit it. So... I actually took a little bit of statistics from uh, Paridi before coming here. So about what kind of student strength you have. So, and I, I took some uh, details about what kind of campus placements that you get, what kind of salaries you get, and I got a sense of all of that. If I'm an opportunist, and if I put the numbers together, this campus is a gold mine not for actually going out and work. How many people would have realized that? Don't, don't create a right here after the session when I, when I start just talking about certain numbers. Just giving you an example. I was just putting the numbers together. There are 1,600 or 1,800 students here. And you have a full-fledged uh, residential uh, campus here. You have cafeterias here. Have you ever thought about what would be the catering contract for this campus would be? I'll just put some numbers together. 1,800 students, 300 days. I put two meals or three meals per day. 100 rupees per meal. If you put the multiplier factor, so I'll say uh, 2,000 meals per day into 300 days into 100. That is six crores of rupees. Normally in a catering business, margins are upwards of 25%, and this is a captive audience. If I am an opportunist, I'll come here, establish a good rapport, and see, can I get the catering here? I make an a crore and a half, right? How many of you have seen this opportunity? You don't need all this studies. So that, that's, I, I'm, I'm just giving you an example of how, how to find opportunities. So there is opportunities sitting everywhere. It is how you spot it. I can give you another example of opportunity. Uh, these days, WhatsApp groups are very active, especially people like us who have passed out from school many years back, we get group messages and people organize alumni meets of batches. Even our batch is also meeting maybe two, three weeks later. There was a proposal to invite uh, the teachers. So something came about financing of that because the, the uh, hotel accommodation and other thing could cost probably 10,000 rupees per teacher. It could be an expense. I immediately said, I'm happy to underwrite that. I found an opportunity there. It could be probably two lakhs of rupees for me underwriting that I don't expect more than 20 teachers to come and I don't expect the expense to be 20 lakhs, two, two lakhs. But you know what is the opportunity there? I will 
socialize it and popularize it. Rana is sponsoring all the teachers. And you know, many of the students will have attachment to various teachers. They will come forward and say that I want to sponsor. I'll say for you money is 25,000 per teacher, right? So that's an opportunity there. So I'm, I'm just giving you examples of where opportunity lies and you have to spot it and capitalize it. That is where your success lies. Now, uh, I, 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 I would like you to stop me anywhere and uh, ask me questions about what you wanted to uh, uh, hear from me or thoughts about it. Before that, I'll, I'll give you some uh, insights about, uh, I was told that something about what to look forward in a, in a placement. Mo many of you have completed your pre-placement, uh, uh, actually, what, what is it called? Internship, yeah, internship. And some of you have got pre-placement offers. Few others are looking out for pre uh, uh, internships and looking for pre-placement offers. So that is where you are. So you are actually uh, at the uh, tipping point of an old canoe in the sense of your career. That is, this particular stage actually is going to define which direction you are going to go. So I know that you have here students from different streams, say it, HR systems, marketing, all of that. So you have to really uh, prepare in advance, not by self, but you will have to actually reach out to uh, the people who work outside to understand what is the work that is waiting for you. So it is easy to say that I want to go and work in a bank, for example. I'm, I'm used to working in, in, in banks. I have in all my life worked in the financial sector, so I can actually relate uh, many stuff to the financial sector. So if you take an example of, let's say, a standard chartered bank coming here for a recruitment, uh, Parisi was telling me that uh, they offer you a management trainee uh, position. But it's very important for you to ask them, what is the job that is available in standard chartered? And what is it that you should be pitching for? So if in a bank, if you look at, there are many, many, many verticals within the bank. Broad classification is between a retail and an institutional. Within retail, you will have personal banking, you will have personal loans, you would have trading. So likewise, there are multiple businesses. Within businesses, then you will have a sales function, a marketing function, an advertising function. So there's all different functions within that. So there is so much of super specialization sitting there. And each one of you will have a desire for a particular kind of work. So you have to understand that what is it that you like. And I can tell you that probably 80 or 90% of what you study in the college will not be of much use when you enter the corporate world. You'll have to start from scratch there. That's the reality. Once you get there, what you see is completely different from what you see. So if you have to get the right stream that you want, you have to first have some ideas within you. What is the segment in a particular industry which I should be trying to focus upon? So if you get that clarity in you, then probably you can connect with the interviewers far better and place yourself into the most uh, appropriate position in that selection process. And also when they are selecting you, I believe most of the recruiters would have already identified you for which role within the organization. They would be actually uh, marking it in that selection procedure that for which department or which function this person is suitable. The interviewer would be marking it. Probably there would be some more further uh, screening at a later stage, but the initial channelization would be happening at the initial stage. So if you are good, you would probably in the first and the best possible opportunity, you will be potentially placing you at the right place and you get the right uh, path 
opening up before you. So that's what you could perhaps do, which you should try to do. And my advice is try to invite your immediate seniors probably one, two, three years uh, in a row. Get more probably class-wise sessions with them and invite people whom you think are willing to open up to you and tell you the real pitfalls which they faced in choosing uh, a particular company, a particular career, and even when they had different opportunities, how did they actually choose each one of that? So when they share that, you will get to know how you should be prepared, and when you get an opportunity, how to actually select, because selection is really, really important. Just before entering here, I was asking about how does the uh, placement process happen? What, are there any limitations on placement uh, acceptance? I'm told that once you have sat for pre-placement and you have sat for the interview, and if you are shortlisted, you have no choice but to accept it. So that means you have to make a choice of what to sit for. That choice has to be very carefully made because when you do not have a job in hand, you are actually craving to get something in hand first. But if that's the wrong choice, your opportunity is gone unless the dream company comes. I faced exactly the same, same situation. I was in the first batch, the first company came in with full enthusiasm, I went there, not the first company, one of the first company, their first day itself, I got placed. Pala sir promised us that you will have an opportunity to sit for two. But the next few days, the companies flowing in were not so much. He immediately changed the rule, only one, so I am out. What is the mistake that I made? I, I was frustrated because that was not the first company which I chose, was not something which I so much liked, but now I'm out of the system. Now I'm seeing so many other companies coming. I couldn't stand it. So what did I do? I refused to come to the college during that time so that I don't, I, I don't add up my frustration. Mistake number one, first, you should not allow your frustration to move over your aspirations because I should have been coming and waiting at the college, waiting for the, the other opportunities, trying to make Look for an opportunity to, to impress upon if the director. If everything else fails, if your company of your choice has come, even try to meet the interviewer outside and somehow convince them, I am the candidate for you. I am unfortunately not able to sit for the interview. Please select me. Somehow make it there. You should be looking for that opportunity. I never did that. But I was lucky. That time, Sebi came into the campus and it was a rare uh, uh, coming, so I was called. But again, I was lucky. There was no mobile phones, there was no telephone in the place where I was staying. But I had the good relationship with my friends. So somebody took the bike and came to my home and called me to the campus. So I came over, sat for the interview and got selected. I was again lucky, really lucky. So if somebody did not have taken that effort to come to my home and call me, I wouldn't have made it. I would not pr probably in, in this particular profession now, I would have been in, in some other profession. So that's something which you have to be always uh, careful, that be patient but be determined. And don't lose sight of what is it that you are looking for. So always make sure that that particular, what you call, frustration should get into your mind at this stage because you don't get this opportunity of companies coming to your doorstep. So you should not lose that opportunity. So that's, that's what I, I can tell you. The other, uh, again, I was told about the internship program, what you should uh, learn from the internship programs. I did my internship in Thermax. Just, I, I thought, just now Bala sir shared with me that that was actually, a, a, the, our internship program was actually a, a, a problem and a solution for him. We used to have classes post two o'clock, so he wanted to make sure that we, we are not loitering around 
and, and probably making a nuisance value for others. So we, he wanted to make us occupied or keep us occupied for the first half of the day. So he put us into this internship program. So that was the reason why he put us into the internship program. So what was the benefit which we made it? When I started it, so I, did, I, did, I don't come from, I was not hailing from Pune, so I was staying in a, a rented apartment. I didn't get into the hostel, so I was, so money was scarce, food was scarce. Thermax used to offer us breakfast, lunch, and 650 rupees of uh, stipend. That was the incentive for me to go there. But I knew that I am determined to make sure that I should be learning something from there and adding some value. I was posted to the materials department, dealing with quality control teams, some thermostats, some, some, some kind of Thermax, uh, those uh, heat recovery division, some thermal equipments, small petty valves and all kinds of stuff, dealing with suppliers, making sure that the quality control is all done. But what did I learn? To deal with all these petty issues. So during the internship programs, what you as a uh, recipient, what you get is a clear insight into how an organization functions. So once you go there, you get to see the reality. And what you see the reality and what is actually happening inside is again different because nobody out there is willing to teach you because that's a waste of time for them unless they believe that you are going to add some value to them. So you have to, from start, showing them that what is that value can be, what value you can be. Initially, you can be of value of probably some data entry, some filing, help, helping them to put uh, uh, files into particular folders, organizing the, uh, uh, their own directories. You could be anything, any menial work, but what is it that you are initially gaining? The confidence of the people with whom you are attached to. Then they start gradually opening up. And once they open up, believe me, then you, they will start giving you independent work. Till such time they don't give you that independent work, you don't get any benefit out of it. So that's what you learn. So that ability to do independent work, how does it help you? I'll, I'll switch a, a little bit off from there, how does it help you? You all think that the world is very complex. It is complex, but the success is in actually breaking down that into very simple binary stuff. So what does a leader do? The leader actually breaks complex problems into simple binary elements and delegates it to different people. But while selecting those different people, he has to choose the right people and make sure that it is done in time. For example, if you are working in a manufacturing unit and you are in a car assembly, you have broken down all those engine manufacturing and everything into small individual parts, the car is fully assembled, but the steering wheel is awaited. Any use, no use. The car can't hit the road because the simple steering wheel is still lying under manufacturing line with somebody. So that is the importance of each elementary task. Now what is there in the leader? The leader has broken up the complex problem into small elementary stuff and then he has allocated it to the properly identified delegates and made sure that those delegates deliver and has properly supervised them and kept a full eye like if my eye has to reach the last person right out there at the corner I should be able to see what he's doing. I should be walking up to him and see what he's thinking and is he in trouble. That's the leader. So that's how a leader performs and makes sure that he executes it. That's what you have to learn. So when you go for the internship program, what is it that you, you understand? That each of that elementary task also has something which can make it binary. That means it cannot happen. 
if you don't perform it. So you have to realize it. So that's what you, you have to learn from these internship programs and that also brings in confidence in you that you, you have the ability to, to perform which you think adds value to others. You always believe in yourself, but somebody else has to believe in you. That is when it, the, the, the realization comes. So I, I, I leave it here and uh, offer it up to you to ask any questions if you have, uh, if there is sufficient time. So I hope, I, first and foremost, I hope I haven't tried to actually bore you down because I, I have tried to uh, tell you what I thought was right. And another important thing which I, I also want to share you is try to be decisive, okay? Uh, in, in, the, in the current environment, what we see is people refuse to take a stand. They stand in the mid path. You know why? because they are scared of making a mistake. So if you, what is it that you have to learn? You have to actually garner the courage to admit your mistake in front of a crowd as big as this. So if you have that courage to admit your mistake, then you don't have a problem or, or any, any issue in taking a stand in a particular issue because you, you are not worried about admitting if it goes wrong. But if you're scared that you may have to actually acknowledge before a large crowd that I have made a mistake, then you will be always undecisive. That is disastrous. That will be disastrous for yourself and the team that you're working with and for whomsoever you're working with. And try to be as ethical as possible in what you do. In Balas's uh, problems or opportunities, I have also seen a, a, another statement, be selfish, but be positively selfish. When I mean selfish, try to take care of yourself in every opportunity and situation, but maintain your ethical standards. That's something which actually will take you a long way because you should always have the courage as well as openness in you to look at anybody into their eyes and speak because if you are doing the things the right way. Now, a uh, few more uh, very uh, radical thoughts into for, for you, quite radical. Uh, you are actually uh, probably at the uh, cusp of probably a metamorphosis in the corporate world. Probably you are better positioned than us because we are actually having years of experience and we are biased. We think that certain things can be done only in a particular way. So that is called traditional approach or things which we have done in a traditional way. But there is going to be a radical change that is what is expected, that is what is the prediction of many business models. So many of the traditional businesses or models that you are seeing will completely change in the next probably few years. So when I, when I say that is the typical sales calls may change. Uh, this typical marketing methodology may change. Uh, the typical client ownership process may change. So many of the processes will radically change in such a way that things will have to be completely done in a different way. So for example, today you will see a lot of advertisements which are in a mass communication process. We are actually getting into a digital world where each of our digital behavior is going to be tracked 
and not only tracked, it's going to be evaluated. So tomorrow, if you want to apply for a loan, perhaps your digital behavior is going to give you or make the bank grant you a loan. And probably the loan prop could be granted by not a bank. It could be a platform, a, a platform which you are using like a, a Paytim or, or something like that. They would know because when each time when you are actually logging into something, for example, a Paytim or Uber or any of them, they make you uh, sign up a lot of stuff and ask for access to many of your data. So when I say your digital behavior will get tracked by them, they will exactly know what you are buying, what salary you are earning because your salary statement would be coming to your email. They will see what kind of expenditure that you are having, what kind of bank balances that you are making, what kind of investments that you are seeing, what kind of advertisements you are seeing, what kind of purchases you are making. All of this put together, they can easily make out what is your digital behavior like. Basis that somebody can recommend that this person looks to be a good earning guy, paying his credit card bills on time, earning a good fat salary, paying back his loans on time, he's eligible for a good loan. I underwrite him for a loan of 10 lakhs. So who has got the ownership of me as a, a customer? That particular platform, not the bank. So you would be looking for a job with a bank, but actually the service provider has moved from the bank to the platform. So that's the difference. So probably what we are targeting and what we actually come in could be different. I actually carried the newspaper, I forgot to take it. There are two, uh, that, that's I think Hindu business line. There's a one, if you can read it, there's a front page on, uh, can somebody get, get it? On uh, I think Flipkart laying off 500 people. 700, yeah. So uh, Flipkart to lay off nearly 400 employees. So you would have all made purchases in Flipkart. I also have made purchases in Flipkart. So you all read it. There is a related story in the same newspaper. Have you all read? Has anybody read? No? Anyone? Sorry, I didn't hear that. No. This is the one. Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos. Okay, Amazon's valuation has gone up. Right, so I myself have used Flipkart. I now only buy through Amazon. Okay. So I believe probably Amazon has stuck to the ethical standards. Clearly the ethical standards of making sure that the right suppliers are selected. I look for all the fulfilled, the, the uh, items which are said fulfilled. Do you know the, the reason why they call it fulfilled? Sorry? Yeah, I, I believe Amazon actually inventorizes that. That means they are so certain of the product that they take inventory of that product, so it is in their custody. So that means they are partly taking the risk of selling that because they have bought it all over from the supplier. So that's the confidence of Amazon. So probably the right diligence has already been done. So this explains who in the long run actually would actually do. That's why, remember, ethical standards, if you, if you try to maintain, and if you are good, you will go do a, a, a long way. So uh, uh, I actually wanted to actually, there's a, these days we get a lot of WhatsApp messages. Uh, some of them are, are quite interesting. So I, I just wanted to read out one of the, uh, kind of fact joke which was which recently came to me, probably you would have read. The students of MBBS were attending their first biochemistry class. They all gathered around the uh, lab table with a urine sample. The professor dipped his finger in urine and tasted it in his own mouth. Then he asked the students to do the same. 
The students hesitated for several minutes, but at last everyone dipped their finger in urine sample and tasted it. Have, have you read it? Right? When everyone finished, the professor looked at them and said the most important quality is I dipped in my middle finger but tasted my index finger. <laughs> right? So then what was his theme? How to pay attention. So you need to pay attention to what is there before you. That will take you a long way, really, really long way. In if you are observant and if you pay attention at the right time. So that's why I, I started with initial Bala Sir's, the Delhi seminar and the, in the president uh, story. He was observant. He had read the profile of each of our batchmates and, and realized that one of the students had an ADC as a brother. So he observed it and he capitalized it. And I can tell you that was his first breakthrough. He will admit it and that is why you will find that that is there in, in every of his first photograph there. That would have given him in more confidence because for a, a, a unknown campus to go all the way to Delhi and have the Indian president inaugurate the camp, the conference is not a joke, it's un, not thinkable. But he did it, but what was the success of that? that small ADC connection there, right? So it was his observation. Uh, again, one more observation or, or rather experience which I can, few months back, we had a session with Harsha Bogle. Uh, you might be wondering, we, we, one of the, the top investment banks, Swiss bank, calling Harsha Bogle, who's a, a cricket commentator, for a brainstorming session. And we had a very interesting session. So he actually related many of our, our corporate activities to the, the cricket uh, event and the importance of a manager and a captain. Then he said, a good captain is someone who knows the personal strengths, weaknesses of each player. He's the one who can actually motivate. So he should be knowing each of that players, including his personal problems as well as strengths. So that that's makes a captain an excellent captain. So Sachin Tendulkar, if he was not a great captain, probably because he did not have that in him. He's a great player, but not a great captain. So he actually gave us all those insights about it. So there are a lot of things which you can actually relate from your daily uh, life. How many of you have gone swimming on, in the beach? How many of you know swimming? You have a swimming pool here. How many of you have crossed the third wave? Anyone? Not a single hand, right? Yeah. How does it feel like? Not an answer up, up for me, but I'll tell you, I have crossed it. I'll, I'll tell you the, the other part of it also. After the third wave, the sea is calm like a lake. There is no moment. You will be shocked, absolutely shocked that you cross the third wave. You stand there. You just have to lift yourself like this because the water is just moving like this. You have to keep your head up. It's stagnant than a swimming pool. Can you believe it? That's the fact. Now, how did I experience it? I did not have the balls to go there. I come from a small town, it's a beach town. So the fishermen actually took me there. That's why in a, in a crowd of probably 600, just you have just one guy. So I was taken in there by the fishermen. So why would a fisherman take me there? Because I used to mingle with them. I used to go along with them. I used to play football with them. I used to go fishing with them. So they took me inside. And 
even if some other unknown fisherman comes and takes me, I would never go because I would never have the balls to go into the sea like that because the sea is so rough. So my connect with them gave them the confidence or gave them some, not confidence actually, they, they, they thought that probably it, it, for the relationship they will take me inside. I had the confidence in them that because they will not betray me because I knew them. So they took me there. But the learning is what, once you cross the three waves, you are there. What was the other learning for me? I am from that same town. I have seen the sea during the low tide. So when the waves recede, I can see that the sea goes like this and goes up. So wave one, two and three and standing on a cliff. So I'm not going to drown, but I need to cross this. So the fishermen allowed me to cross it. Now relate it to you. You think that the corporate world is tough, it is tough. You cross the first three, you are there inside. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't take uh, questions. If any, if there is time, I'm happy to uh, take general questions, personal questions. Technical questions, avoidable. <laughs> Good morning, sir. I am Vartika Jaiswal from BIIB, Finance Specialization. Uh, so my question to you is, there was an article in, in Economic Times where it was mentioned that market thinks Britain economy will grow after Brexit, but at, as Credit Suisse analysts believe otherwise. So uh, what's your take on it? See, as I said, it's, it's quite a technical question and uh, uh, probably uh, for me, in, in my, my personal opinion, in fact, uh, to a group of uh, financial uh, experts, on the day the Brexit happened, exactly the Brexit happened, we had a global chief investment officer uh, conference, worldwide conference, addressing the uh, private wealth advisors. And he was advising that this is not, this day is not the trough. There could be much more to come. People are so much of overbought. There will be so much of selling. Uh, and you know what happened after that. The market fully rebound. And on that, and, and he also was announcing that probably the, the turmoil would be so much that the British Prime Minister would have to resign. Even before he resigned, he actually had predicted that, which many people predicted. I had actually the joke which I, about the MBBS students, the pay attention part, I had circulated to my group to say that, pay attention to what is happening. So if people pay attention, they will realize that Brexit is an event which will happen, but I think the world is too big for uh, something like that to drag us down. So we as uh, uh, a, a country and you as a, a group of people who are just entering the corporate world, I can give you another statistics in relation to that. I think the, the Brexit to us matters a, a, a bit because we have a uh, lot of companies having exposure to uh, the European uh, countries, UK. So there we could have some impact. The larger concern on Brexit is they have a concern of the European Union fully breaking up because even other countries deciding to go out. So that will cause disruption in the market, which will create short-term issues or probably longer term issues also. But the larger prediction is about India. Okay, there was uh, YC Deveshwar, ITC chairman's address maybe few weeks or few days back. There he has given his statistics about Indian economy or rather the Indian population. Indian population constitutes 17% of the world population. We have 
two and a half percent of the land mass of the world, four percent of natural uh, water resources, and perhaps one and a half percent of the natural resources. That is what we are having. This is from YC Deveshwar's speech just three days back in ITC's uh, annual general shareholders meeting. So what does that say? 17% of the world population is sitting in India. And we are expecting that um, a large part of them is going to become, uh, become the middle class or close to the middle class very soon. So there is uh, a large segment of the population who is going to have high disposable income. So I just earlier told you about the catering contract for this campus. Six crores, uh, that's just a ballpark number, one and a half crores of margin. Now if I start rattling down the public ad address system and the electrical contract for this, the uh, utility services here, the laundry services here, housekeeping here, stationery here. So likewise, if I add up, there is a civilization sitting here itself. So if I am smart, I can actually set up an enterprise for myself even here. I can make my beginning from here. And the importance of uh, the, the, the numbers which I have just told you is, you will get the perspective because I gave you the, the six crore number, which is a staggering number. Probably if you go and do the number crunching, you'll get it. I think you hope somewhere, get somewhere near there. The key point there is, this college is going to run for a while. The uh, population of this 200 meals, uh, 2,000 meals per day, which I said, it's going to hover around there for a very long time because the student of 1800 is going to be in the range of 1500 or 1800 thereabout. You all are going to eat. You all are, 600, 600 of you are, are going to be in this campus. So for certain that number is steady, right? So anybody who gets that contract, he has a visibility of a business which is certain. So he has an ability to set up an infrastructure by making capital investment. So there he has an assured captive audience of consumers. He can make a capital investment with an assured uh, revenue. Stage two is for the better part of it. This is just the foundation, leveraging on it. Once I'm a caterer here, I have the infrastructure here. I can start using the, this base to cater to other nearby colleges, if I have quality, if I have food quality, I can start delivering, right? So any of that service which I deliver here, once I establish, I learn the trick in one year. Then I can leverage. The world runs on leveraging. So you have a, a, a captive business model and then you can leverage, right? So I don't know if you, if you go into your, your catering uh, place, what kind of hygiene standards you may have. So if this is the kind of revenue model I have, I probably pu can put in auto utensil cleaning process with 120 degree uh, temperature control cleansing process to, to remove all the germs, all those kind of processes probably I can put in. Nobody can match me as compared to a manual uh, cooking process or anything. So I can put across a lot of radical processes into it. So that's, that's the, the benefit of doing this and the captive audience. So I'm just giving you a, a, an opportunity part of it. So during our time, Balasa used to uh, bring somebody by the name of Chitle sir who is to come and teach us entrepreneurship. But I don't think ever he told us about these kind of uh, possibility of doing it probably then I would have been a caterer doing catering business now had it <laughs> taught me these kind of business opportunities there. So that's that's it. I, I don't know how much I have tried to answer your, your, your question. So if there are any more questions, or if there are time left, I... I 
Good morning, sir. My name is Devang Rajgur, uh, Finance Specialization, BIIB. My question to you, uh, Credit Suisse has, have came, up, uh, came up with a bank branch in India, I think in Mumbai. Uh, the fact relating to it is uh, Credit Suisse exists in 57 countries from where they can uh, leverage the funds at a lesser rate of interest and can utilize in India. So why to uh, open a bank in a branch in India, take deposits from them and pay a higher rate of interest to them? Uh, opening a bank branch is not necessarily for only uh, d collecting deposits. Okay, there are, that's just a small part of our business. So what you typically see as a bank is what you as a layman would be seeing. That is a, a savings account deposit, but the banks doesn't work on that. Uh, if you look at the balance sheet of banks and see uh, what is the uh, deposit that any of the, I don't want to talk about Credit Suisse because Credit Suisse doesn't do retail banking anywhere outside Zurich. They do only corporate banking. We have only one bank in Mumbai. I, I am an employee there, so I know the, the numbers there. So that's, that's not the business what we do, but the banks leverage. When I say leverage means we actually take money, deposit from you, then based on that de the deposit what we take from you, probably we give you a, a interest of 6%, we lend it at 14%. We raise capital from the market, perhaps at 9.5%, again lend it at 13%. On that basis, again, we further leverage. So you have capital, we again borrow. So we keep on. That is why this Lehman crisis and other, the over-leveraging part all came in. So you have something called statutory liquidity ratio. That is something which the Reserve Bank of India insists that every bank, that is, I think, some 6% or something that you have to maintain. So wh why is that for? So that banks don't over-leverage, and when the depositors come back, to ask for money, you are able to pay back. Now, directly answering your question about when we have 57 uh, uh, country exposures, why don't you bring money which are lying outside? You have to uh, start uh, learning to understand how controlled are our economies. Capital account convertibility as well as full, full convertibility of Indian currency is not there. Indian currency cannot be brought into the country freely. There are something called foreign direct investment and other foreign currency inflow terms. So there are limits over which where you can bring in money into the country. There are licenses required for bringing money into the country. So you can bring in money only for certain purposes and there are limits put over there. So foreign currency, it's not that you can borrow money at 2% offshore and then bring that money into the country and invest at your own free will. So there are a lot of restrictions around how money can come in and flow out of the country. And plus, there is a huge risk which lies there, which is the FX risk. If I borrow in dollar and bring that into the country and uh, I, I, my currency depreciates by 10%, I lose money. Right. So there are, it's, it's a fair, uh, complicated, not complicated actually, and a subject which you need to understand much more. So, so that's the, the short answer that I can give you. It's not a free flow back and forth. And banks are not only for deposit taking. That would be just p perhaps 5% of what they do. Thank you, sir. Your insights on having a vision, an action plan, and an awareness of opportunities, all powered by one's willpower, have definitely ignited our thought process and have inspired us. I now request Professor D.S. Kadam, Director, Projects and Alumni Affairs, to present a memento to our chief guest, Mr. Rana Rajan, Director, General Counsel Division, Credit Suisse. 